All right, it's good to see everybody here today. We're going to look forward to our time of worship together. And uh, I pray the Lord bless us. Bob's going to come for us and read now from Psalm 142. Good morning. Please turn with me to Psalm 142. Good to see everyone here. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, I privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. If you failed me, no man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. And we pray. Praise the heavenly Father, we thank you. The opportunity to read your word, dear Lord. Open our eyes to see it, see Christ in it, dear Lord, from beginning to end. We're so thankful for this time. Be with Ken as he brings forth the message that we may put aside the cares of the day and worship you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Precious word, especially as we see it fulfilled in Christ. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, sing this hymn to the tune of Guide Me. Oh, thou great Jehovah. Oh, my soul, admire and wonder, Jesus, there and died for thee. He has broke the bands asunder and from bondage set thee free. Sweet deliverance, sweet deliverance, Jesus Christ has brought for me. Jesus Christ has brought for me. All the death I had contracted, he in mercy called his own. And lest I should be neglected, drew me near his gracious throne. Paid all charges, paid all charges, then and for the time to come, then and for the time to come. Soon I hope. To see his glory and with all the saints above, sing and tell the pleasant story in the highest strains of love and forever and forever live and reign with him above. Live and reign with him above. Amen. All right. Robert is going to come and read for us from John 17. Good morning. Good morning. John 17, the reading of the Lord's Word. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 
I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in, in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, sanctify them through the tr thy truth, thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known thou, that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and I do declare it that the, that the love of wherewith thou hast loved me, may be in them, and I in them. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you now, and we just praise you. Lord, we have a great Savior. Lord, you are our only hope. Uh, outside of Christ, we are all the abominations of the Father. Father, forgive us for our sin. Be with Brother Ken as he delivers the word today, and be with each and every one here today. Lord, we ask this in Christ's name. Great chapter. We'll be coming back to that in a little bit during the message. But let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 17. Let's stand and sing this together. Come thou fount of every blessing. The blessing of God is in through by his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is that fount. Come the fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues of all. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, 
nature, watering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to be. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. You can see it. Look with me, if you will, in your Bible to Genesis chapter 47. Other than perhaps Abraham, I don't know of any other person, or perhaps David, that the Spirit of God has directed as much in the Scripture to, of course, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously, but his person and his work than what we have here with Joseph. We stop and think about how long we have been studying. And of course, we do it every time we meet around the Lord's table. But studying the life of Joseph and seeing him as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ that he was sent there, even through all of his affliction, that he might save much people alive. And so here, in Genesis chapter 47, he's brought his brethren to him, he's revealed himself to them, and now he's sustaining them. We saw in verse 12, the last time, Joseph nourished his father, and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. If you can think of Christ, is there anything that any one of his household lacks? Nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, we're unbelieving. Sometimes we look at circumstances because our eyes aren't on Christ, but there's no want with him. So what I want us to see here in this portion, in verse 13 down to verse 41, how all authority is given him, just like all authority has been given Christ. Robert just read it in John 17, in verse 3. He thanked his Father, that the Father had given him authority over all flesh. This is what we're going to see here. Joseph had authority over all of Egypt. All flesh. But for one purpose, to preserve his people alive. Now, the world benefits from God's grace toward his people. I believe that. I believe he'll prosper an entire business of ungodly and reprobate sinners, prosper their business to feed one of his elect. Stop thinking about it. Where are you working right now? How many of those believe? this gospel and know of Christ. They don't, but they're benefiting and you have a job and God has prospered it in order to feed you as one of his sheep. That's an amazing thing. But that's what I see here with Joseph. So it says in verse 13, let's just read this. There was no bread in all the land for the famine was very sore so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. That's pretty much the world at that time. You have Egypt and you had all the land of Canaan. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. 
Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, and for the flocks, and for the cattle of the herds, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year, and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also had our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread. And we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the Egypt even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not. For the priests had a portion assigned to them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore they sold not their lands. And Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. It shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your household, and for food for your little ones. They said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Joseph made it a law for the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possession therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. That's the part I told you. All this other taking care of the, of the world, so to speak, had in view these right here in verse 27. I don't read anywhere where any one of these ever had to come and ask Joseph, please take care of us. He already was. What the Lord was doing is bringing these others to bow to his servant, Joseph. Their physical need, but what a precious verse here in verse 27 when you think about it. In the middle of all this, not one required demand of any one of his household. It says they dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possession therein. They had possession already. They didn't have to get it. Why? Because Joseph had given it to them. And they grew and multiplied exceedingly. So while the world is withering up in Egypt and having to pay the fifth part to Pharaoh, who was their God. Here's Joseph with regard to Israel, not one mention of any fifth part of them ever needing. Talk about special grace. Joseph had his eye on his own. That's why the Lord brought him down there, saved much people alive. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. Time drew nigh that Israel must die, that is Jacob. And he called his sons, his son Joseph, and said unto him, I now, if now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt. Bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. 
and said, Swear unto me. And he sware unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. So what a beautiful picture we have here of Joseph as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in whose hands is all authority. And that's what in John 17, 3, we just heard read. He thanked the Father. Our Lord thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh. Imagine these in Egypt. This had to be a very humbling thing because Egypt back in the day was a very prominent nation and power. And yet the Lord brought them low, down so low to the point where they were actually selling themselves into servitude to Pharaoh in order to live and exist. And yet, over it all, God had placed Joseph. Had it been left up to man's so-called free will, they would have never selected Joseph. He wasn't even an Egyptian. He'd been brought there, but God gave him favor in the eyes of the people. And so he rose to this position where even those that actually were God-haters were brought to him to where they had to ask from his hand substance with which to live. I find it interesting here that when Joseph was making this divide, he left the priests alone. Did you see that when you read that, verse 22? One of the land of the priests bought, he the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh. He didn't try to get in there and meddle with that idolatry. They were Pharaohs. They, they, they actually lived pretty sumptuously because everything about the religion of Egypt had to do with false worship. That's why when you get on into the New Testament and you read about places like Babylon, but Egypt... These were places of false worship, but no different than when our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. The whole world lies in wickedness, and he was subject unto the powers that be during the time he was on this earth. He wasn't a lawbreaker out there just making marches and contesting against the Bible, but in and through his life, he had but one purpose, although he was showing mercy by his miracles and breaking of bread. There were many that benefited from our Lord's life in this earth that were not the Lord's, just like here. Many benefited in Egypt that were not kin to Joseph or of that household, but the whole purpose was to save a people alive, just like with Christ. He had but one purpose in walking through this world, and that was to call out those that the Father had given. Because the Father loved him and heard him. And for that reason, Joseph also was heard because he was God's representative there in that land of Egypt. So, when we talk about all authority being in the hands of Christ, the first thing I see here is all authority in times of distress. A lot of people think, well, if everything's in God's hands, then it's always going to be prosperous. There's always going to be good times. And if not, something must be wrong with us. But here we see how God used these times of distress, of no bread in all the land. That word, when it says there, for the famine was very sore, it means very heavy. This is something that we have to recognize, that even God for Christ's sake, can disturb entire nations and turn them upside down. The world looks at it and wonders, what are we doing wrong? But it's really God exercising his authority for the purpose of glorifying his son. This world is not turning around us, by the way. Everything that takes place, even in the upheaval, and I dare say I've never lived through a famine like it's described here, but I know some people that have. Imagine living in a land where you have to walk eight hours every day just to get water and walk back eight hours 
and then have to use that water sparingly for drink and for cooking and for bathing, and then to know that the only thing you can do is turn around and walk another eight hours to get it again and come back. There are people that are living that way right now in this world. And I tell you, most people think, well, that's because they're idolaters, or that's because the this or that. They always, I'll tell you why it is, it's because God's purpose. Let it be so. And I have seen in his purpose where he's shaken down entire nations to shake out one of his elect for whom Christ paid the debt, that that one would never have left their land had it not been for a famine or a storm or a war. And lo and behold, they light on a place where they hear of Christ and the gospel, and they rejoice. They go back and thank God for the famine. Ruth would never have met Boaz had it not been for a famine in the land that took Elimelech and his two sons down there in that land, and people are saying, well, he was backslid because he went to Moab, and he let his sons marry those Moabitess women, and shouldn't have done this and shouldn't have done that. But God was directing it all to bring out a Ruth that would never have encountered a Boaz. And if you don't think that that was a vital direction of the Lord, because that Ruth, the Moabitess, is actually in that lineage of, from which Christ came. You can't explain that in terms of just human choice. This is God doing his work. And whenever you think that the distress is too much, you can't handle it. This says the famine was very sore, literally heavy. So that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan, that word fainted, it means exhausted to the point of becoming languid and spiritless. I'll tell you, as far as those sinners that Christ came to save, that's exactly how he deals with each one. He's got to strip us of anything in us to the point where we have nowhere to turn. You know, that's what it is to be lost. It means to have no way back. And that unless it be Christ, as represented here by Joseph, the one who deals the bread, and gives us what we need, we would most certainly perish. So here, again, all authority in his hands, even in this time of distress. We never see, when I read this, did you see Joseph fretting? Through it all. When it says all authority is hand, it's take charge. The worse it got, the more prominent became the necessity for his wisdom in dealing with that situation. There's no word here of them helping Joseph out. Like people say, we gotta help God out. We gotta get his work done. No, he's gonna strip our hands completely off of it. So then in the end, we know that if there's any deliverance, it's got to be Christ and Christ alone. So we kind of run from those situations, don't we? Let's be honest. We don't like having our shoulders pinned to the mat. And if we had any wiggle worm, we would continue to wiggle. But the Lord strips us of all of that. It shows us that we're nothing in order that Christ himself be glorified. So all authority in times of distress. But secondly, what I would say here, and, and this was serious because not only did the land fail, but you notice it says there in verse 15, they came back. It says when the money failed, so it got down to where there wasn't even anything to buy anything with. The country in Africa that I grew up in is called Chad. It's right in the heart of Africa. And when I was growing up, you realize the na national gross income per individual was $75 a year. You say, well, how do you get along with just $75 a year? Well, you learn to market. 
if you've got something to plant, you invite the neighbors and they go help you plant it. And if they got a cow or you got a sheep or whatever, you're doing some part in trading. I looked up the other day at what the gross national average is for income there in Chad, and it's still $75 a year. That's all the way from back in the mid 50s when I was growing up there to, to now, and it hadn't changed. And you think, wow, how long can people endure under that particular lifestyle as long as God determines? Let's don't get too comfortable in our society and thinking, oh, that'll never happen here. The only reason it hasn't is because God has purposed otherwise. Think about the things that we complain about, such as the air condition going out or, you know, oh, cars broken down, now I gotta use my other car. Oh, we have gotten fattened in our in God's mercy. But if he were to take it all away, could we still have this hope in the Lord Jesus Christ alone? And look to him just as, as, as desperately as these that had no other hope when the kingdom of money failed. The Lord's in distress. He's in the famine. He's in the storm. He's in the war. But he's doing it for the purpose of one person who's seated on the throne there in glory. The Lord began to open my eyes to see that Christ is a subject to all the scriptures. Revelation used to be a closed book. Because I've been taught, you know, you gotta you gotta read this verse and they gotta go over here in the world and see what's unfolding over here and try to understand this verse. And yeah, we're getting closer. It was all about times and seasons. And I completely missed the very first verse, Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the whole book's about. And it was for the encouragement of the early church, and it's for our encouragement today. He's ascended in God into glory, but he's not absent. All the seals and the and the, the vials and the trumpets sounding, that's him exercising his authority now, not in some time by and by. And every time a seal was open, there had there was a death, there was famine, there was war. The Lord was causing it to shake up this earth, and he's still doing it. But it's coming from his hand. Because all authority's been given unto him. I'll tell you, that gives me rest and peace. If these things were happening randomly, can you imagine? We'd be scared to even put our head out the door. But to know that there's nothing that touches one of his own, what comes from the hand of Christ himself. That's a glorious truth. But the Lord brought these, the, the example of these Egyptians, saying to him, there in verse 15, why should we die in thy presence? There's an urgency that was here that was not there before as long as they had what they had. So when the Lord strips all this away, suddenly it causes us to realize that unless he shows me mercy, I'll have no mercy. When everything else fails, he fails not. He fails not. He's not wringing his hand. Joseph wasn't wringing his hand. He wasn't calling a council to decide, okay, we got some pretty serious matters here because this is the whole land of Egypt and Canaan. What are we going to do? We better get some volunteers going, get people involved, get people out there working. Nope. Everything I read here had to do with Joseph determining what would be done next. That's what you do when all authority is put in your hand. So, all authority in distress, secondly, all authority in, in his providential dealings with men. Joseph said, give your cattle, and I'll give you of your cattle if money failed. You can see again how he was dealing differently with these Egyptians than he did with his own household. Scripture says to come to the Look at it in Isaiah 55. When we come to the, the market of free grace, there's a distinction made. As far as the world is concerned, God is directing all things, even in buying and trading and selling. 
The Lord determines these things from his throne. That's why in James it says that if you say today or tomorrow I'm going to such and such, say if the Lord's will, I will do such and such. That's how he's directing the affairs and there's times when he puts us into those situations where we buy and sell and trade in order to exercise that responsibility of caring for our own. But when it comes to the gospel, there's no buy, selling, and trade. It's like Joseph here with his household. While all this else was going on in Egypt, Joseph never took his eye off of his household. They never once had to come to him and demand anything. It was his grace toward them because of who they are. But all authority being his hand, he directed all things. His providential dealings with these was according to his authority. But when it comes to grace, Isaiah 55, I'll tell you, if you've ever seen yourself as that needy sinner, this is a precious verse. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. And he that hath no money, think of the money failed. And yet, the Joseph represented the treasure house. It says, come ye. It says, buy and eat. But it's a manner of speaking. It's a marketplace. Come buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk. But notice, without money and without price. That's how the Lord directs in the hearts of those for whom he paid the debt. He puts us in that situation to where when we're drawn to him, it's coming to that marketplace of grace, if you will, but don't bring your money. Don't bring your works. Don't bring your effort. It's without money and without price to us. Why is it without money and price to us? Because Christ paid the debt. That ransom that he paid to his father for this people. All of Joseph's sufferings represent the sufferings of Christ and his death while he was in prison and his resurrection when he was raised and brought out and his ascension to glory. All of that was for a people that God purposed to save alive. When the Lord brought them together, it was till death do they come. Joseph was there to care for them. He spend money for that which is not bread. There's a bunch of people still striving out there when Christ said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He said, Why don't they come to Christ? Well, they're still not tired. As long as you think you've got something wherewith to present yourself before God, you're going to still keep doing and trying and endeavor. Unless the Lord strips it all away from you, that's how you'll die. But you'll never know the rest that there is in Christ. All you can say there is that God purpose you die the, the death of the unrighteous. But oh, to be thankful. Just think of Jacob and his family. What brought them to Egypt? It was the family. And it didn't end when they got there. It continued. And yet, Joseph was their sustenance. Joseph was their savior. Joseph was their deliverer. That's why the Lord raised him. Why is it that I've come to Christ? Whereas the world seems to still be striving and going and still not tired. Well, that would be our case unless the Spirit of God had completely stripped us and showed us our need of Christ and Christ alone. That, that's where our rest is. Wherefore do ye spend for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. Now, but as I've mentioned before, the word good in English is actually the derivative of the word God. So, eat ye that which is of God. Because anything that comes from these hands is certainly to bring condemnation. But to eat that which is good, God is good. All authority put into Christ's hands, all that he has accomplished on behalf of sinners.
and let your soul delight itself in fatness. I don't know if it could be actually said this way, but I see it here, Genesis 47, when all of Israel, I mean all of Egypt was striving and struggling and trying to figure it out and bartering and all these things. In verse 27, Israel dwelt in the land and they had possession therein for Joseph's sake. I wonder if some people didn't start to notice that here's all these Egyptians that didn't have food and they're getting skinnier by the day. And here's these Israelites over here because that word in Isaiah 55 talks about fatness. How do you know somebody's well off? Well, we're pretty big. That's a pretty good sign that we're taking care of. That's a sign of prosperity. And yet, in all of that, it was because of Joseph's. It says they had possession in that land. They weren't starving like the rest. They weren't bartering. They weren't trading. This, this was free grace for them, even though for these others, they, was, they struggled and they had to give up everything they had in order to survive. But that brings me to the third point about all authority in his hand. That's all authority in the deepest need. Just when you think that, okay, Lord, I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm about as low as I can be. The Lord says, no, you're not. And yet, even in that, it continues to prove himself faithful. Here in verse 18, so it says, when that year was ended, you're thinking, well, prayerfully now, We'll get back to being to have some normalcy. They came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord. You can imagine the kinds of discussions that were going on in the households. What do we do? How that our money is spent. And my Lord also have our herds of cattle. So he had already taken everything from them. And now the money's gone. Notice it says, there is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. How low can you get to where you have to sell yourself to be able to provide a meal? But it was to that degree that the Lord brought these. What? To exalt before their eyes the wisdom and authority of Joseph. I say this, you don't come to somebody that doesn't have the answer. When people say to me, well, if I believe that God was sovereign, I'd never even pray. And I turn that around and tell them, if I believe that he weren't sovereign, I'd never pray. If God's not sovereign, there's no, no need in even bothering him. For him to say, well, no, I... I've done all I can do, now the rest is up to you. You see, there, there's no hope in that kind of God. That isn't even God. The more that God created the situation and brought them to their deepest need, now this doesn't mean that here that they were converted to Israel's God, but they were brought, because all authority being put in Joseph's hand, they were brought to, to have to confess their need of him even though they still held on to their religion. But that's how God exercises his authority. All authority in his hand, even in the deepest need. And you know what? He determines the beginning and end of these things. I hear people saying today, well, God promised if we'll just be a praying nation and humble ourselves, he's going to turn it around. They're praying to a God of prosperity. When it begins to hit the pocketbook and things get left, that's how they start crying out. It's like these Egyptians. But I'll tell you, the Lord is going to, his son is seated on the throne, and he's directing all things in this universe to the glory of his son. It's like everything's turning in orbit around the sun. Everything in life and death has to do with the son of God. Him determined what will be and what isn't. So that brings me to the fourth 
point that I want to bring out here is that he has this authority over all matters and all peoples. Not just as many people think of God, they think, well, if there's a good, that's God doing it. If there's evil, that's Satan doing it. And there's this little tug of war going on. And like I heard one preacher say one time about election, he said, well, God chose or determined what he wanted to do. And the devil, so he cast his vote. And the devil, he's cast his vote against God. So now it's up to us to determine. That's how they view election. Believe it or not, you won't find that in the Bible. But again, it's men refusing to have him to reign over them. And that just shows the depth and depravity of this heart. That if we question God in any matter, we're questioning his authority to do what he will, when he will, and where he will. I can tell you, we've not known God unless he has been so revealed unto us. Maybe at this point in time, the Egyptians had heard about this man Joseph but they were busy about their other things doing whatever they thought confiding in their own riches and wisdom and giving the glory to their gods when suddenly over a period of these years it worsens and worsens to where if even if they didn't want to deal with them now they were having to deal with it I've had people tell me that. Well, that, that might be the way that you believe God, but I'm going to believe how I want to. Well, guess what? The day's coming when one way or another you're going to have to deal with this God, whether in this life or in judgment. And I'll tell you, unless he graciously draws you through his son, there's no hope. You can run, but you can't hide. When they said, we got to tell you what's going on or how we can no longer hide it, but we haven't got even two pennies to twit to press together to, to, to say that we're going to be able to take care of ourselves. Utterly cast upon them. And so whether it's the buying and selling of goods, this is God's sovereignty. Directed for the glory of his son, just like with Joseph. Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. That's an amazing thing. That means every bit of it went to the government. We, we fight against that today. We think, no, we got our individual. But in this, it got so bad that there was no other option. And yet the Lord purposed. The displacement of people was in his hand. It says there in verse 21, as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. That wasn't even left up to them to say, well, here's your choices. If you're wanting to find a place where during this famine you can kind of have a at least some existence. He didn't say that, but the choice is yours. I can't intervene. No. He removed them to cities. He directed them for their good. I'll tell you whether people recognize it or not, that's what God's doing. He's directing all things. I would not be in Shreveport, Louisiana today by my own choice. All of you know that. Came here and preached one time in 1990. And on my way out of town, I said to myself, I am so glad to be leaving Shreveport, Louisiana. And guess what? 1995, the Lord parachuted me in here. The surprise of many. What? Someone from Africa? In Shreveport? I didn't even know where it was on the map until... The Lord so great. Here I am. Now you can't get rid of it. It's been 23 years. Unless the Lord does. I have no intention to move, but he, he removes from place to place as he purposes. He directs in all things. The distribution of seed. Who is it that gives the seed? It's, it's the Lord. In the economy of all the goods. How all of that distribution takes place was according to his direction. And some might look and say, well, it's not really fair. It wasn't equal. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. He determined exactly how it would be accomplished. But then we get to the 
real purpose of it all here. In verse 27 down to verse 30, and that is all authority. Not only in the deliverance of his own, but in the, their preservation. When I consider what it is to be a child of God, I can take no glory for it. The fact that I am here declaring unto you, using Joseph as a type, I feel like an artist here. I'm painting a picture for you by words. But it's not really me. It's the word. I'm just telling you what this word says. And I know I can tell by some of you looking down and looking up and your eyes sparkling. You're, the Lord's showing you things that maybe I haven't even said yet. But as you go back and keep reading and looking, he discovers all the more that, yes, this really is about Christ's glory. In type and picture and promise. And not just a story to tell, but this is to the glory of his son and how he saves sinners and how he keeps those sinners all the way to the end. And I'm thankful it's that way. It's not the Lord seeking the sheep and then getting them out of the trouble and then putting them down and saying, patting them on the rear and saying, now don't do that again. Prone to wander, we sang it. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. That's why sheep are a very good illustration of what it is to be the Lord's. Sheep are dumb, but so are we. We're stupid. We couldn't find our way out of the thicket. Thankfully, the scripture always describes the Lord picking up his sheep and carrying them all the way to the end. And even Jacob here understood it in his years. Be careful of wishing for a long life. 147 years on this earth. Remember when he told Pharaoh, and that was 17 years prior. When Pharaoh asked him how old you were, his answer was, I've lived a long life. It's been full of trouble. But as he died, that's what impressed me. He said, don't bury me here in Egypt. I have nothing with which to identify with Egypt. But carry me out of Egypt and bury me in that, their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And when the Lord brought Israel up out of Egypt. They carried Jacob's bones with them back to that promised land. That's just the picture, even unto death, how one that's taught of the Lord, their one desire. I mean, this was important to him. I don't want in any way in my life or death to identify with this idolatrous nation. His identification was with Joseph. And with that deliverance that the Lord granted him for Joseph's sake. And with that, he bowed himself upon that his head and died. I'll tell you, if we're the Lord's, regardless of when that time comes, we can die in peace. Regardless of the surroundings, knowing that it is he that keeps us and not us keeping him. All right. A lot there. I just, my, my heart's full. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 145. One forty-five. Hail, thou once despised Jesus. Let's stand and sing this, and there in the second verse, rather than die, is full atonement made. Atonement is a covering. Christ's death wasn't a covering. It was a redemption. We sing redemption. Hail, thou once despised Jesus. Hail the Galilean King, Thou didst suffer to release us, Thou didst free salvation bring. Hail that agonizing Savior, Bearer of our sin and shame. By thy merits we find favor, Life is given through thy name, as the Lamb by God appointed. All our sins on thee were laid, by Almighty love anointed. Thou hast full redemption made, all thy people are forgiven. Through the birth 
virtue of thy love. Open is the gate of heaven. Be six made to its man and God. Jesus hailed from the glory. Therefore ever to abide. All the heavenly hosts adore thee. Seated at thy father's side. Therefore, sinners, thou art pleading, there thou dost our place prepare. Ever for us interceding, till in glory we appear. Worship, honor, power, and blessing, thou art worthy to receive. Loudest praises without ceasing, me it is for us to give. Help ye bright angelic spirits, bring your sweetest, noblest place. Help to sing our Savior's fairness, help to chant Emmanuel's praise. May be seated. Our taking of the Lord's table. I said that in doing this, you do show forth his death until he come. The word show forth really means to declare or to preach. So if we have this cup in our hand and this bread in our hand, we are making a declaration of faith. Now, this is the law in Hebrews 10. It says the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things it was there in type and picture and promise and prophecy so I would say that the same with these elements that they are a picture of Christ the unleavened bread representing his body without sin and yet roast with fire and the cup representing his death, his blood shed, both were necessary. But there's no salvation in the bread. It's a time. There's no salvation in the cup. You can take this cup and drink it, but that's not salvation. The salvation is in who it represents and what this blood represents. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews said those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect in the old testament they they offered those sacrifices and they came according to what god required but that did not make them perfect nor should we think that partaking at the lord's table in any way adds to our standing before god because it doesn't it's the way that God has ordained that we enjoy that fellowship with him in Christ and this being a remembrance of who he is and why he came and what he accomplished. Here it says, if there had been perfection in the Old Testament, then would they not have ceased to be offered? There's some religions that really treat these elements like sacraments, that's what they call them. Somehow in partaking, you are actually receiving the grace of God through the elements. Nothing could be further from the truth. If that were the case, then let's forget every other thing and let's just keep drinking and eating, drinking and eating. Just like with the law. It says, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. The word remembrance, what are we remembering exactly by partaking here at the Lord's table? We're remembering the death of Christ, but we're remembering sins having been put away. That's what we're remembering. For it's not possible, verse 4 of Hebrews 10, that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It's not possible that the partaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup should take away sins wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not 
There's literally people that make an idol out of partaking of the Lord's table. They may never sit under the preaching of Christ at any point, but oh, that's serving communion today. I got to be there. They treat it just like it's a, a rabbit's foot. I don't want God to be mad. But that's not what this is about. It says, A body has thou prepared me. That's what this bread is about, that body that was prepared. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the body of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So in partaking, we're remembering the outworking of why Christ came into this world. It was to do the will of his Father. And the volume of the book is written. That was written in that book of God's eternal decree that it should be. It's written in this book of Revelation we have, right? But when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he might establish the second. The working out in a body as a man is what we're remembering here. And that righteousness that required his death, that's what we're remembering. Because it says, by the which will we are sanctified that word sanctified are sanctified is put in a tense that means we were sanctified and we continue to be sanctified now notice through the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all that's what we're remembering here and every priest stand of daily ministry and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin that was in the old testament but this man, so we're remembering the man, the God man, body and blood. God's a spirit. He can't die. But in coming to this earth as a man, he had a body and he had blood. And it was for one purpose, the sacrificing of himself. Pay the sin debt of his people. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Every sinner is going to be brought to bow one way or another, either in grace or in judgment. For by one offering, I love this, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. But we're not doing this for greater perfection. No, it's we're remembering that all of our sanctification, all of our justification, all of our redemption is in him. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. The whole Godhead's involved in this. What the Father purposed, the Son accomplished, and the Spirit reveals. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. He's talking about Christ coming, doing and dying. Again. I'll put my laws into their hearts. A law is a rule. We don't go back to the old law on the tables of stone, no, but written in the heart and their minds. How is it that I worship God by his spirit? With the heart and with the mind. According to how he's been pleased to reveal himself in, in their sins and iniquities, will I remember no more. Complete satisfaction. That's why when we come to the Lord's table and I think, okay, how many sins did I commit today or this week? Or what I really have to confess before I partake. I'll tell you, if Christ paid your debt, it was all put away. It says here, there's sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And that's really why we come to this table, for that reason. It's not to get a clean slate and go out that door and know it's going to get messed up again, so now i got to get another clean slate before the next time I part. No. We celebrate the fact that by this one death, our sins and our iniquities, he remembers no more. And it says, now where remission of these is, where that putting away of sin is, that's, that says that there was no sin put away until Christ died. But there is no more offering for sin. What we hold in our hand is a declaration that this is the one offering represents his body and his blood. For that we give him the praise.
know, a word of prayer and thank the Lord. And Lord our gracious Father, thank you for the word, for the clarity of it that explains everything we do by way of worship. May in the light of this hour we come before you partaking of this table that you have set forth us to remember your blessed Son body that was given him he might lay it down there sacrificing himself in the bloodshed that being all your satisfaction that as a result there is no other offering for sin we dare not look anywhere else but to your son so i pray that we partake our eyes might be upon him and him alone the thankfulness and rejoicing who he is, the great salvation that he accomplished for sinners such as we are. We praise, honor, and glory of his dear precious son. All right, let's take our hymn books and sing one final hymn, and then we'll be dismissed. We are going to be going over to the Atchison's following a time of worship, and we have to spend some time in fellowship there. So I would encourage everybody who can to. Join us. The uh, noise is a great time. Appreciate you opening your home for us. So, uh, hymn number 127. Let's stand and sing this. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Seal my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He, full redemption can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior, lifted was he to die? It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring. Then I knew this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior.